couple stories that are going to kind of define uh, visualization and deliberate practice. The unfair advantage that they have that everyone else can't see to see the wrap their brains around. They know what's going to happen before it happens. They have a blueprint for the future. They're living in the future. They're basically just connecting the dots and absorbing the moment when it materializes. That's a championship moment. Now, why are some people champions and winning Super 32 belts? And some people get there and they get sent home in two matches. It's because the people who are best prepared did their mental preparation, the pieces of that mental preparation that are most important in your visualization for your path, okay? And um, we've been talking a lot about visualization and it goes beyond being able to just see yourself doing something, okay? Um, one story that, uh, about visualization kind of starts with golf um, in a happier sense, and then it goes into a golf uh, and something that happened to someone that might be one of the worst things that could ever happen to a human being. So you guys know who Jordan Spieth is, a golfer? golfer? He's pretty good, right? He at one time was ranked number one in the world, or he may or may not be right now. But uh, he has a mindset coach, and his mindset coach tells him, it's his caddy, they talk through every, every hit, they talk about uh, the approach that he's going to have to the ball, the way that he's going to see the dimples in the ball, the way he's going to clasp his hands just right the every time, the, the trajectory that he's going to have it, and he lets all that loose. He's went through that mental preparation, and he goes up, and he hits the shot like he's done it one million times. Uh, a more remarkable story was what was about someone in a war, and uh, there was a guy named um, General Naismith, and he was in a war called the Vietnam War. It was a very divisive war in our country. Um, people didn't like it. And uh, this guy was over there um, giving up his life and his freedom here in, the co in our country, and he was over there serving. Um, and Vietnam is a jungle, and it's a, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy jungle, and it was very combative, and there was a lot of uh, booby traps and things that trap you. And uh, once they would trap you, they would keep you as a prisoner of war. And uh, General Naismith was trapped by the Vietnamese, and he was a uh, prisoner of war. And his living conditions were a five by five by five cell, or five, however you want to call it. So essentially he had a box like this that he lived in day in and day out, okay? So he went in thinking, hey, I'm gonna make it through this. I'm gonna find a way to get out of this, no matter what it takes. He said, I'm gonna be as mentally strong as I, as I can. He was a casual golfer like some of your dads are. He shot about a 95 grade. That's a, probably like a very average golfer but you love the sport and you love to do it. So he said, I'm gonna make golf my vision every day. I'm gonna play a round of golf. For four hours, I'm gonna sit in a five by five by five cell and I'm gonna play a game of golf. I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna get my bag. I'm gonna walk up to the first tee. I'm gonna put my golf club, my, 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 my tee down. I'm gonna put my golf, my golf ball on. I'm gonna collect my club. I'm gonna hit every shot. I'm gonna to listen to the blades of the cat grass being cut by the lawn mowing team. I'm gonna see another crew coming up and getting beverages. I'm soaking up all the sights and sounds. He did this hole one, hole two, all the way through the bend, through the turn, hole 18, okay? He did this every single day with no end in sight. Year came, year two, year three, year four, no end in sight, but he didn't lose hope. He did the same thing for four hours a day in a five by five by five shell. So he went through the same four hour golf, same thing, same 18 holes, same course, same everything. He held true to it. Year five, year six, year seven, he keeps coming. And finally, seven and a half years, he was released. He came back to the United States and you know, he acclimated himself and he, he wanted to play golf again. And um, he shot 95 before he was captured for seven and a half years. And what do you think he shot his first 18 holes back out on the course? You probably expect about a 95, right? I mean, he's been practicing in his head. He can't be any better, right? Guess what he shot? 45. No, that'd be impossible. That's like impossible. That's like impossible. Yeah, you're talking about 18 holes. A pro would be a, a 72, roughly. So he shot a 75. He went from a 95 to a 75 in seven and a half years without swinging a golf club by sitting in a five by five cell, visualizing the same thing every day. 
when other people were out playing golf and living their lives and getting better at it, he actually surpassed them in a little, little box that he found life and a little game of golf that kept him alive. And that's, that's visualization in the most remarkable sense. Okay? Soak that up. That's real. Second piece of this, I'll make this a little bit shorter, but there's um, something called deliberate practice. And that's when you do something the same way all the time and you become extremely good at it. Basketball players, you could think about free throws, right? They deliber deliberately practice a free throw. So when I've seen the best of the best free throw shooters talk about what they do, I actually watched this guy the other night explain it. He would go up to the basket and he found obsession with that, that, that swish. So he would go up in front of it, he would start his day, and he knew how important the arc was. He'd get that arc, get that arc. It's dropping through the bottom. So he'd get that arc, then he'd go back, and he'd think about his hand placement. Think his hand placement, he'd think about his spin of the ball, he'd think about his release, and those are about all the mechanics he would need. He would think about that every progression, he'd step back, he would um, shoot his shots, and he became very good at it, okay? Then he thought that was good enough. That's kind of what everybody else was doing. He wanted to take himself with another layer or level to this. So he wanted to hit the bottom of the net every time. That could be very frustrating for a basketball player. He didn't want to hit the rim. He wanted to hit the bottom of the net. He wanted to, he obsessed over actually, AJ, you know, every hit a shot and then the net actually comes back up on the rim. That's what he wanted. He wanted that. And he went on to uh, have a college career and, um, and he played in the NBA, and he was a 90% shooter in the NBA. That's as good as like any of the all-time greats, Steph Curry or Seth Curry or Reggie Miller, or anybody um, like that. That's called deliberate practice, okay? That's an example that we can all relate to with basketball. Now there's a story of a horse. You guys ever seen the movie Secretariat? Okay, yeah. it's yeah. about a horse who does the impossible. And there's three legs of a triple crown, okay? And I, I can't remember the first, I don't know if I'm gonna get these ordered. The, 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 the Kentucky Derby's first. Yes, Yeah. The Preakness is second, and the Belmont is third. Okay, so you have this horse who's a long shot. The Triple Crown is the most. It, it's like in America. It's like one of the most most storied prize things that you can win, and it's very rich in tradition and history. If you've ever been to a horse race, you'll understand. But anyway, this is the grand. This is the World Series, the Super Bowl of, of horse racing. He wins. The first race, the Louisville, the Louisville or Kentucky Derby, sorry. Long shot wins it. He wins the Preakness. Long shot wins it. The next course is the course that eats all the horses. This is for the young ones. This is an old dog. This is a horse that most people gave up on. They actually gave a coin flip to even get him to the first leg of the Triple Crown. The owner of the horse, I can't remember her name, but she deliberately practiced him. She ran him. And when he was tired, she freaking ran him again. And when he was tired, she ran him again. And people were saying, you're going to kill your horse. She didn't think that he had that, that level within him. She ran him, and she ran him, and she ran him, and she ran him. And uh, come the day of the Belmont, um, she went over, and she, uh, she gave her vision to the horse. And uh, she looked at the, uh, at the jockey, and, 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 and no words were exchanged. The horse took the line. And an old horse at that jumped right out of the gate, full sprint, full sprint. Like, you know, if you're going to run a, a whole race, you can't sprint right away. You've got to pace yourself. But he went gone for broke with everything you have and was out right away from the jump. And next thing you know, they said in the first quarter of the race that he had a better distance than any race in the history of horse racing has ever had a better quarter race. He smoked everybody. And the next thing you know, it was down to two horses. And they're all coming around. And everybody's thinking, this horse is going to taper. It's halfway through. And it's holding strong. Johnny, same pace. And nothing is falling apart. This thing is going Usain Bolt the whole way, full sprint, all the way around, all the way around the backside, all the way down the home stretch. Ends up winning this race by, they define this as 31, I don't know if I'm going to hack this, but 31 horse lengths or roughly two seconds. It's a record that's held true, um, I think, to this day. And there was even a recent uh, Triple Crown winner, and it wasn't even that. That was deliberate practice on an old dog who everyone threw in the towel on. Who, hey, you know, some people were going to make dog food out of. Some people were going to kill this horse off. And you know what it did? 
It did something that no one else thought it could do because it deliberately practiced it over and over and over. And that jockey, they interviewed him afterwards and they said, what was the secret? What did you do? He just said, I was along for the ride. He was just along for the ride. It was, it was, it was within him, the work had been done. Remember, that man in that prison cell, he saw it, he believed it, he did it. That, door, that horse that was dead for, dead for nothing, he went out there, they ranked, this is the number two sporting event in the history of all sports in America. All the World Series, all the Super Bowls, the number one is when Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. The number two is that horse race, is the number two event. They actually ranked that horse, the number 35 athlete in the world of all time is a horse. There are no other animals, right? That's how big that moment was. A horse dog given to be dead wins a, wins a horse race. Of the biggest and most grandest, and when horse racing was probably at its, mag, uh, or at its peak. And um, AJ, that's what you can take. And Chris, that's what you can take, okay? Whatever you believe is what you will become, okay? So those people define belief, and they became what they become because they were believing so deeply within themselves, okay? Anybody can be a champion, okay? You just have to find your system of beliefs, okay? People think that it's up here. It's not, it's right here. It's in your brain, it's in your belief, okay? That's all I got. I believe in you guys. Keep showing up, get 1% better every day. Three big claps. All right, good job, guys. Great.